Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover how the mind-muscle connection influences muscle growth. First, we need to establish what the mind-muscle connection is. This is not a well-defined phenomenon, it is more of a perceived sensation rather than an objectively definable term. The mind-muscle connection refers to the perceived feeling of muscle contraction during resistance training. It is the deliberate and conscious focus of contracting a specific muscle or specific region of a muscle while lifting. Trainees often seek a strong mind-muscle connection while lifting, as it is often seen as an indicator of a good training stimulus. We will explore if this is actually true later in this video, but for now let's just understand that the mind-muscle connection is a perceived sensation of muscle contraction. The mind-muscle connection can also be related to the specific attentional focus. This refers to what the lifter is specifically focusing on while performing an exercise. An external focus is when a trainee is purely focused on the outcome of the lift. This refers to training with the intent to complete the lift, regardless of what specific muscles are working. For example, if a trainee is performing a one rep max attempt on a squat, then they are probably going to be solely focused on completing the lift, not what muscles are being trained. On the other side of the spectrum, we have an internal focus. This refers to the intentional effort to contract a specific muscle involved in the exercise. For example, a lifter may focus on specifically contracting the pec muscles during a dumbbell bench press. When using these attentional focus strategies, the mind-muscle connection can essentially be described as an internal attentional focus during resistance training. The mind-muscle connection is not a black and white phenomenon. Rather, it seems to exist more on a spectrum, where trainees can experience more or less of a mind-muscle connection. The level of connection experienced is influenced by many different factors. Let's now cover what these are. The first factor influencing the mind-muscle connection is the specific muscle group being trained. Some muscle groups generally experience more of a connection than others based on their anatomical structure. It is common for trainees to experience a better connection training some muscle groups and a poorer connection training others. For example, the triceps often experience a strong connection during some isolation lifts, but it is usually more difficult to recreate this sensation for the front or middle delts. The next factor influencing the mind-muscle connection is exercise selection. Some exercises naturally result in a superior connection compared with others. Generally, isolation lifts allow a greater connection, while trainees don't seem to experience the same level of contraction during compound lifts. This is probably because there are more muscles involved with compound lifts, while only one primary muscle is being trained during isolation lifts. As a result, there are more stimuli being presented simultaneously during compound lifts, and it is more difficult to experience contraction of a single muscle. Therefore, the trainee can focus more on the mind-muscle connection for a single muscle during isolation lifts. Another factor to consider is lifting technique. How we perform the lift will significantly influence the mind-muscle connection. If a lifter uses a technique that has the intention to maximize the stimulus of the target muscle, then we are likely to feel a stronger mind-muscle connection. Trainees can manipulate tempo, lifting biomechanics, limb position and more to alter the technique of the lift. Ultimately, this can influence the sense of muscle contraction that is experienced during the exercise. The next factor which can influence the mind-muscle connection is training experience. More experienced lifters are usually able to establish a superior mind-muscle connection than less experienced lifters. This is probably due to various factors. Experienced trainees have established what exercises feel best specifically for them, and what technique results in the best connection specifically for them too. Also, they are probably more neurally efficient with most exercises because they have performed them consistently for years and years. This allows them to maximize motor unit recruitment so that they are all involved in the lift. And the last factor which can influence the mind-muscle connection is attentional focus. Like we mentioned, an internal focus has the intent to contract a specific muscle, while an external focus is an emphasis on the outcome of the exercise. Obviously, an internal focus will usually result in a superior sense of contraction compared with an external focus. So depending on what we are focusing on during the exercise and what type of training we are performing, we may experience more or less of a mind-muscle connection. Usually during strength training, the mind-muscle connection is limited, while hypertrophy-focused training results in a greater connection. 
So how does the mind-muscle connection influence muscle growth? This idea of the mind-muscle connection was established well before any research was conducted on it. This idea has been around ever since the 1970s, with guys like Arnold preaching its importance during their bodybuilding training, and it was probably a common term used in that community even before this era. While the history of the mind-muscle connection is probably not that important, the point is that bodybuilders and lifting enthusiasts have been preaching this idea for decades. Thinking about this from a logical perspective, let's try to understand what benefits the mind-muscle connection may have for trainees. If a lifter focuses on the mind-muscle connection during training, it may hypothetically increase muscle activation of the target muscle, resulting in more stress distributed to that muscle. As a result, the target muscle will experience greater disruption, and hypertrophy adaptations will be superior for that particular muscle group. This is a hypothetical idea, and we will now explore if this has any truth behind it. Luckily, we have a small body of research on this topic to help us understand how the mind-muscle connection influences hypertrophy. First, we need to explore the effect of the mind-muscle connection on muscle activation. So the question is, does focusing on the mind-muscle connection increase muscle activity? Luckily, we have a few studies investigating this topic, which we will now explore. This first study explored the effects of bench press training with different verbal cues. Trainees perform the bench press exercise under three different conditions, and muscle activation of the chest, triceps, and delts were recorded. In one condition, the participants were given no specific verbal cues. In the second condition, they were instructed to specifically focus on contracting the chest. And in the third condition, subjects were instructed to specifically focus on contracting the triceps. Trainees performed four sets of the bench press at 50% 1RM, followed by 80% 1RM, and muscle activity was recorded for each of these sets. In the 50% 1RM set, we can see that the verbal cueing seemed to have a small impact on muscle activity. The chest-focused condition resulted in greater muscle activity of the pecs, while the tricep focus increased triceps activity. However, during the set using 80% 1RM, we can see that there was no specific influence of any verbal cue. As we can see, there was an increase in activity of all muscles with each subsequent condition. This is probably due to the study design, as this was the order that each condition was performed in, with only 3 minutes rest between conditions. So the subjects would have accumulated more fatigue after each set, resulting in greater muscle activity in each set. So this study basically suggests that at submaximal loads, focusing on contracting a specific muscle may increase activation. However, when heavier loads are used, or when we train closer to failure, the specific attentional focus probably makes less of a difference in muscle activity. We also have a similar study investigating the effects of different attentional focuses during the bench press exercise. In this study, trainees performed the bench press with 85% 1RM and took each set to failure, with three different attentional focuses. In the first condition, trainees were instructed to focus on contracting the chest muscles. In the second condition, subjects were instructed to push towards an external object above the participant's chest. And in the third condition, trainees were instructed to drive the bar towards the ceiling. Muscle activity of the chest, anterior delts, and triceps were recorded in each condition. This study had a better design, not only because it had trainees push closer to failure, but also because each condition was performed on separate days, minimizing the interference of fatigue between sets. As we can see, muscle activity of the pecs was slightly greater in the internal chest focus condition, with no significant differences in the other groups. And lastly, we have a study exploring the effects of attentional focus on muscle activity during an isolation exercise. This study explored the effects of an internal versus external focus on biceps activity during bicep curls. Trainees performed 10 reps of bicep curls to failure using an internal and external attentional focus. The results found that biceps activity was greater in the internal attention focus compared with the external focus. So from these three studies, we can establish that specifically focusing on contracting a specific muscle probably increases the involvement of that muscle slightly in an exercise. This seems to apply both to compound and isolation lifts. However, as sets are taken closer to failure, the difference in muscle activity seems to be minimal. So it seems that focusing on the mind-muscle connection probably results in slightly greater muscle activation. However, muscle activity is not a direct measure of hypertrophy. What we really want to know is does this slight increase in muscle activity extrapolate to superior muscle growth? 
I could only find one study investigating the effects of attentional focus on actual hypertrophy outcomes. This study explored the effects of an internal versus external attentional focus on muscle growth. Trainees performed leg extensions and barbell bicep curls for eight weeks, and changes in biceps and quad hypertrophy were assessed. Subjects performed four sets of eight to 12 reps to failure, three times per week for eight weeks. One group used an internal focus where they focused on contracting the muscle with each repetition, while the other group focused on simply completing the lift. While there was no significant differences in quad muscle growth, the internal focus group saw superior growth of the biceps. These results are not conclusive, but overall there may be a potential benefit to focusing on the mind-muscle connection. So, how does all this information apply to our own training? Well, it seems that focusing on contracting the muscle during an exercise may result in greater muscle activation. However, when sets are taken closer to failure, the differences in muscle activation are probably less significant. There is also some evidence suggesting that this may result in greater long-term muscle growth, although more evidence is required before drawing these conclusions. Overall, it seems that focusing on establishing a strong mind-muscle connection during resistance training is probably a useful strategy to maximize muscle growth. Trainees should probably try to intentionally contract the muscle they are trying to train in both compound and isolation lifts. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.